I'm not even talking anymore because I think that what I have to say is important. In fact, if you don't like what I have to say, I'm going to feel crushed that what I said wasn't important. Because I'm valuing what you say. Actually, I'm valuing you listening to me rather than serving you. So there was a time, for instance, when I would do ministry and I realized that I had this problem. Have you ever felt like no one was listening? Huh? That was a good one. Have you ever felt like no one was listening? Or have you ever felt like no one understood you? Um, you know, I think there's a... I have a saying, when someone starts to yell, that means that they don't believe anyone's listening. Okay. So if some if you're if you have a relationship with somebody and they start to yell at you, then it's a pretty good you know you might get upset that they're yelling at you, right? But it's a pretty good indicator that there's a feeling on that other end that the person that they're talking to is not really listening. Make sense? And so I guess we can probably talk about a couple things today, maybe more than what I was actually putting here. Um, and so. Um, let's go over to, um, Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter six, verse one through four. It says, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. In order to be seen by them. All right. So first of all, it doesn't say you never practice righteousness in front of people. Okay, because there's another passage that says, "Do your good works before men, so that they might, so that God might receive glory." Okay, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. All right, so when you do good works, you, I mean, we're gonna do good works, and people are gonna see them. What he's talking about is the heart issue behind it. Okay, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by men. <clears throat> no one is really going to be able to answer that question except you and God. And it's really important that you figure out whether or not you're doing your righteousness before, in, in, before men in order to be seen by them or not. Okay, so it's a heart issue. It's all about the heart. Okay. There's this level of trying to impress. Okay. That we all struggle with. So really, if you wanted to talk about what the... the if you wanted to give a title, probably we could say "Beware I just wrote of finding your value in men." Okay, beware of finding your value in men. All right. So, if you are practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. That's really crazy. Actually, it's right, all the, everything I was going to say right th is right there. But there's another scripture that says, <clears throat> the, the, the parable of the talents, it says that whenever they, when they were faithful with the little that they had, and then, then the master said, enter, well and done, good, faithful servant. Right? He says, well done, good, and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of thy master. Right? So the scripture says that the master, when he comes back, he wants to see that we're doing good, and then he wants to reward us. And so... You have to understand everything that, that God does, everything has to do <clears throat> with the heart, okay? Um, it says in Jeremiah 17, verse 10. It says, I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind. I test the mind. I test the inner depths to give to each person according. Okay, so let's look that scripture up. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 17. I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So what's very interesting about this is your heart and your mind don't produce any physical work, 
right? The Bible says that out of the heart are the issues, it comes the issues of life, right? So it says right here, though, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. In other words, it doesn't matter what your ways were, and it doesn't matter what your fruit of your deeds were if you don't pass the test of the mind, if you don't pass the test of the heart. That makes sense? So if you're a rich person and you're giving all this money away and you've given millions and millions of dollars away to the poor, okay, but your heart was to be seen by men, the Bible says it doesn't matter what your deeds were, he's going to search your heart and test your mind. Make sense? He's not looking at what you actually do. He wants to know where it comes from. Why? What's the purpose? <clears throat> Which is why uh, the scripture says that uh, the, there is a way that seems right to a man. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of its way is death. <clears throat> the righteousness that it's talking about up here, in order to be, to be aware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by men, this righteousness, first of all, if it is, he says, watch this, beware of practicing your righteousness, okay? Obviously, it's not righteousness, right? If they're doing it to be seen by men, God doesn't consider it righteous at all, Right? So the righteousness is talking about is not necessarily God's righteousness. It's not even necessarily good deeds. It's actually what we perceive will impress other people. So the righteousness is talking about here is not even God's righteousness. Like when we hear the word righteousness, we just think, oh, it's good stuff. God's good stuff that we're supposed to be doing. And it's not talking about that. It's actually, it's not actually talking about pure righteousness. It's talking about what we perceive Will will be will, that will impress other people with, make sense? So that righteousness that we do before other people, to be seen by men, is all about impressing. Um, impressing. We it's about impressing people. We want people to be impressed with us. We want people to give us a stamp of approval. We want people to give us some sort of value. You know, give us an attaboy, or whatever, a pat on the back, whatever it is, or just. And it doesn't, and so watch this. <clears throat> Some things are more obvious. There's two types of people. There's two types of people that do this. There's the prideful and arrogant person who finds his value in his accomplishments. And then there's the victim. And the victim is now also seeking attention, but differently. Does that make sense? One guy feels like he's not being cared about or loved at all. And they're actually both the same person, but they just handle their they handle their their stuff differently. Make sense? One guy says, I'm gonna glory in my accomplishments because it's all I have going for me, right? <laughs> Makes sense? And this other guy says, I'm gonna glory in whether people are gonna care about me or love me or show me affection. Make sense? Make sense? So everybody getting touched here. There ain't nobody exempt from what I'm saying here. All right? <clears throat> Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay? That's pretty tough. Pharisees were righteous by man's standards, but God searches the heart. Right. Then he talks about anger. You know, if you if you if you are angry with your brother, okay. If you're angry and you call him an idiot or a fool or some other bad word, the Bible says you commit murder in your heart. You know that. If you're lustful, and you look at a woman with lust, or whatever, with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. It says, um, if we make oaths. Right? If we make promises, and we're not talking about the people, okay? Um, he says, don't let your, let your yes be yes and your no be no. In other words, why do we sign an oath? We normally say, well, I swear because the truth is we don't, we're not trustworthy. 
Why, why would I make you promise? Hey, are you promised? Why would I, why would I say that to you unless I felt like you weren't going to come through, right? So an oath is actually kind of weird because it's supposed to be just let your yes be yes and your no be no. If I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Do I need a promise? See what I'm saying? Retaliation, okay? And then loving your enemies. Loving your enemies. So if you have a problem with somebody and you have a problem loving them, yeah, you know, the righteous does not exceed the, the Pharisees. And you know what's funny? Everybody's righteous in their <laughs> own eyes. Well, I'm not doing what such and such is doing. Yep, you're you're in danger of hellfire. Because <laughs> you're not supposed to be comparing your righteousness with other people. That's what the Pharisees did. I'm glad. Watch, look, look, watch this. If you find yourself saying, man, somebody really needs to hear this word. And you're not thinking that you need to hear the word. There's a problem. You might be missing a very important thing for you. Check this out. Anytime, I don't care what you really look like on the outside. I don't care what you look like. You could be um, somebody who doesn't go to church and drinks and does drugs or whatever, right? And you're offended with somebody at the church, right? And you're like, those hypocrites in the church. And you start pointing a finger at them and saying, man, those people are awful. Um, or you can be in the church and you can be looking at the people outside and saying, man, I'm glad I'm not a drug addict, right? Both people are judging the other person, okay? One guy is judging the guy in church and one guy is judging the guy outside of church. But here's actually what makes you a Pharisee. You don't have to be at church. You can be outside of church, okay? Here's what makes you a Pharisee. Or the, here's what makes you what Jesus didn't like about the Pharisees, okay? He says, if you stand on the street corner and you, or if you stand on the street corner to be seen by men, or if in your heart when you pray to God, you say, I'm glad I'm not like that guy over there. I'm not as bad as him. That's what actually puts you in the category of the Pharisees. So if you're on the outside of the church and you're looking at the guy in the church and you're saying, man, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. That guy's a hypocrite. You just became a hypocrite. You just became like what you didn't like. It's pretty weird, huh? And if you're on the outside looking at the people who aren't doing it, who aren't, who aren't coming to church, and you're saying, man, golly, then you're just as guilty. Make sense? Um, our true righteousness comes from faith, right? That means that we get everything from God, not from what we can do. We're not leaning into my abilities. We're not leaning into my knowledge. We're not leaning into... My ability to make people laugh or tell good stories or uh, swing a hammer or whatever. Whatever we want to glory in in our flesh, it's not good enough. Make sense? You have to ask your question, man. Why am I doing what am I doing? Most people, there's only two motivating factors. There's two motives for every decision you make in life. Two. Two. Every, every decision that you make in life can pretty much be boiled down to these two things. Fear or love. Okay? And fear is really love of self. Okay? Self-preservation or I'm trying to get to the top or I want to be... I want people to like me. I want people to see me and 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 like me. So that's fear. That's all fear. Make sense? It's most of our most of our stuff is motivated from fear. Okay? And then love. Self-sacrifice. All right. So um it's it's all about what we do is we try to impress people, okay? So either people want to the, the definition of pride is actually um, being able to uh, basically glory in your accomplishments. Like, I accomplished this. Look what I did. And then what we do is we find value, okay? We got to find our value in our accomplishments. And those accomplishments can be a wide range of things. My ability to make people laugh. You know, tell jokes or tell stories or um, work hard or I have a knowledge about something 
you know, whatever, whatever it is, well, whatever it is we want, it, it, it's not even that we want to even be good at it. We just want people to perceive that we're good at it. Make sense? We might not even be good at it. We just want people to think we're good at it. Because what we don't really value is even the accomplishments. We really just value what people think about us. You see? And that's fear of man. And that's what's very dangerous about it, okay? Um, the Bible teaches us that we only really get righteousness by faith, okay? So we want people to see righteousness so that they'll perceive us as righteous. And like I said, the righteousness isn't... That. When I say the word righteous here, we're not even talking about pure righteousness. We're talking about... We're talking about glory from people, you know? Oh, man, that guy's so awesome. That would be a form of righteousness. Does that make sense? That we are trying to attain or whatever. <clears throat> we do our, we, we let people see our good side, okay? We put up our best front. We're actually afraid. Everything comes from fear. Why am I putting on the best front? Why am I putting on a face? Why am I putting on a mask? Because I'm afraid. Because I don't want people to know my weakness. And only in weakness am I made strong, the Bible says. Only in weakness can God be strong in you. So when we start to confess our weakness, when we start to let down our walls, that's when, first of all, we find our, our, we, we, we find our true friends, right? People that don't really care about our accomplishments, they just care about us. Make sense? That's what the barracks is all about. You know? Ain't nobody can come here and impress me with their master electrician skills. <laughs> or whatever. You know, whatever they've got on their mind that they thinks can impress me. Look, you, I'm going to be more impressed with humility. I'm going to be more impressed with confession of weakness. Because to me, that's more brave. It doesn't take any courage for me to make up a story. Or even to even tell the true story. There's no courage in that. Let's say that I am really, truly good at whatever I'm saying. There's no courage in that. You know where true courage is, is whenever you confess your weakness. When I let down my guard and I make myself vulnerable. That's true courage. That's something to be respected. Make sense? Um, finding out value from people, man. It's so dangerous. It always leads to destruction. It never really truly leads to freedom. When we can when we can let down our guard and become weak and vulnerable before one another, that's where life really comes. Now you might think, well, I'm going to get stoned. They're going to kill me. If I tell all this stuff, everyone's going to hate me. Da, 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 da. Well, actually, you'll just find out who your true friends aren't. Okay? They won't really kill you most of the time. The ones that stick with you, those are the ones you know. Hey, that's the guy. That's the guy I need to stick with. It's good stuff. Um, John chapter 5, verse 44. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? So God wants to give you glory. It's like a new, it's, it's very strange to hear that, but it's truth. John chapter 5, verse 44 says that we actually don't, we actually, check this out. He says here, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from God? This is telling us a secret. The secret, how do I get faith in my life? How do I start to believe? How do I really start believing for things? The first step is stop seeking glory from people and start seeking glory from God. We get glory from God because of His one work. Okay? Knowing that, man, I don't have to do anything to be anything. I don't have to have all these accomplishments or I don't have to make everybody like me to get glory. You know what I have to do? Believe. How can you believe? How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory? What he's saying is, I know that you don't believe 
because you seek glory from one another. But if you seek glory from God, what does that mean? That means my value does not come from men. My value comes from God. And I have to believe in what he did for me to make me who I am. Therefore, I don't got to impress you. I don't have to make you like me. In fact, if you hate me and kill me, it's okay. I know who I am in God. That's why whenever the disciples got whipped and flogged and whatever, it says they came out rejoicing, for they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. When men hated them and despised them, they rejoiced. When no one liked them, they kicked them out of the city. They spoke evil about them. Everyone slandered their name. Called them liars, whatever they did, and beat them. Hated them. They rejoiced. For they were counted worthy. How do you get how do you get a feeling of worthy when you get beat, right? When they hate you. When men hate you, yet you feel worthy. What the? That's so backwards. That's the way we live. That's what. That's the way we're supposed to live. Whenever, when you start to suffer shame, everyone is coming against you, and nobody likes you. Everybody hates you. Do you feel worthy? What that means, if we not, if we don't feel worthy, that means that we're not. That our, our hope is set in the wrong thing. Our hope was set in what men could offer us rather than in what God can offer us. So we set our hope in what God's offering us. That's where our faith is. That's where our belief is. And we're seeking glory from God, not glory from men. It's powerful stuff. It set us free. And it gives us a whole new identity. I'm no longer defined by what people say about me anymore. I'm no longer defined by what my family thinks about me, or my friends, or even my enemies. I'm just defined by what God says about me. And it's a very freeing thing, and it gives you great confidence. It says right here, Luke chapter 14, <clears throat> verse 7 through 11. So Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor. <laughs> You're silly. Do not sit down in a place of honor. Lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited both will come and say to you, Give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up and higher. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. So do not seek the place of honor. That's that's a, a pretty important thing right here. Seeking the place of honor. Do not seek the place of honor. <clears throat> Obviously, look, honor comes from people too, right? The truth is we just don't need to get our value from that, okay? People honor me, and I don't, I'm not arrogant enough to be like, oh, well, you know, don't do... I think it's false humility if you... If you, if you when people do honor you and you just kind of <clears throat> shove it off. You, you just need to live your life humble. You need to live... You need to... Watch this. The Bible says the greatest among you will be the servant. The greatest among you will be the servant. So check this out. There's, a, there's an identity scripture there for you. Do you want to be the greatest? <clears throat> then you need to know what God says about you. If you want to be the greatest... Here's what God says about you. You're a servant. Even David said he was a servant. He was a king. Right. 
So is this a servant of the Lord? Yes. So when we are, when we are, when we know, watch this. Look, I believe I'm great in God. God, I'm, I'm, I'm great in God's eyes. But if I am getting my identity in Christ, then to the world, I won't look very great. I'll look like a servant. And here's what's so awesome about it. When we truly become servants in our hearts, people will honor you. It's a byproduct, okay? Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll hate you, okay? But a lot of times you will get honor. And the reason why is because they're going to see pureness in you. They're going to see, wow, this guy's legit. This guy really does love people. Wow, this guy really does serve people. Man, this guy really isn't thinking about himself. And they'll honor you in front of other people. It just happens. So what do you do in that situation? Oh, well, no, it's not me. You just say thank you. You just say thank you. Why? Because you're not honoring yourself. They're honoring you. You see? Now, if you went in there and took the seat of honor, right? It's one of the reasons why, you know, I used to have, uh, you know, I don't... I used to have a little business card on it, and it said founder. I threw all those away and got new ones. I said, I ain't got to put founder on there, man. I feel weird. So I just put Zach Spiegel. You know what happened after that? Everybody else who was in the ministry would introduce me as, hey, this is the founder of the ministry. I didn't have to put founder on the card. I took that off. I'm thinking, man, I feel weird putting that on there. I, I thought I had to put it on there for business purposes so that, you know, people would know who I was, right? And I thought, you know what? If I do a good enough job serving, they'll all know anyway. You see what I'm saying? If I do a good enough job serving, forget the title. Titles mean nothing. Titles mean nothing. Quit. Quit. Titles mean nothing. All right? <coughs> Look, you know what a title is? A title should describe what you already do. Okay? If I have to give you a, a title before you start serving, well, you might not know who you really are. See what I'm saying? You're getting your definition from your title. Not from who what God says you are. And so what we do is when we that's why when I really start getting lead, people who are true leaders in the program or in our ministry, I wait until they're true leaders. And then I'll say, Hey, that guy's a leader. But it's not because watch this, it's, he's not becoming a leader because I told him he's a leader. I saw leadership in him and therefore I gave him I, I named him leader, you see? Then he, I named him leader, now he's living up to that leader. Does that make sense? Now, what's interesting about that is, again, the Bible says a good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit, correct? A good tree bears good fruit and a bad tree bears bad fruit. So there comes this point where we get and we get our identity, again, from God, not from people. We don't get identity even from our fruit. We get identity from the seed, okay? The Bible says, the greatest among you shall be the servant. That's why God doesn't give you a title. He tells you you're a servant. So you know who you are? You're a servant. So when God gives you that seed of your definition of who you are, all that's wrapped up inside of it is servant. You get it in your heart, you become servant. Okay? Now, if we could really understand that that's what it meant, means to be the boss, if I'm in charge... I'm really just a servant. You see what I'm saying? We have to be that way. Otherwise, we no longer, otherwise we lose our identity. You could be a king and not be a servant and you lost your identity. That's what happened with Saul. He was living for himself. Fear of man instead of fear of God. Destroyed Saul. Saul feared man. So he disobeyed the Lord instead of fearing God. 
So he no longer became a servant to the people. What did he end up doing? Watch this. Check this out. Okay, look at this. It's a powerful lesson from Saul. Check this out. We said the two motivators are fear and love, right? Fear drove Saul. Fear of man drove Saul. He lost his identity as the servant of God and became a ruler of man. He took on the title of ruler of man instead of servant of God. Fear drove him. His first act of sin in this fear of man was when he feared the people. Okay? Let's go over there. Let's find the scripture. He feared the people from the beginning. When he hid behind the baggage. Look, God had already told him he was going to be king. And he hid behind the baggage. He was afraid of men. He was not fearful of God. God gave him a time. God gave him his, his identity. You shall be anointed him as king. Right? He feared men. He hid behind the baggage. Next thing you know, he's he's uh sac he's he's taken all the instead of destroying everything, he took some of the stuff. Watch this. Um he made the sacrifices without without Samuel. Let's find the scripture. There we go. First Samuel 15. Let's go there. Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts. I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them. But kill both man, woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, and donkey. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 men on foot, 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, Go depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came out of Egypt. So let's go forth. The, Lord, the word of the Lord came to Samuel. Okay, oh yeah. Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt, and he took Agag, the king of Amalekites, alive and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatted calves and lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord said, came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and said to Saul, uh, said to him, Blessed be you, blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. That's what Saul said to Samuel. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep? In my ears, and the lowing of the oxen that I hear. Saul said, They have brought they have brought them from the Malachites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop. I will tell you what the Lord has said to me this night, and said to him, Speak. And Samuel said, Though you are little in your own eyes. See that? Though you are little in your own eyes, you are are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? Watch this. Here's the problem Saul had. This is so weird. Look, you have to see yourself as great, but that greatness leads to servanthood. The greatest among you shall be the servant. Your greatness has to come from God, not from men. Does that make sense? You'll be great in God's eyes, but in men's eyes... They won't see you as very significant. You can't let off to people you're significant. You have to know that you're significant in the eyes of God. Okay? Which means you'll never see yourself as little, even though you've made yourself low. 
You'll never see yourself as little even though you've made yourself low because you know you can make yourself low because you know who you are in Christ. I know that I'm great in the kingdom. Therefore, I don't have a problem making myself low before men because I'm confident in the Lord and I don't need man to tell me who I am. Does it make sense what I'm saying? So what was the problem that Saul had? He was little in his eyes. Though you are little in your own eyes, watch this, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? He forgot who he was. He saw himself as little, which caused fear. Look, if you know who you are in God, you'll know you're great, which means you won't be afraid of men. So you can make yourself low. You can die. You can suffer harm, and it's okay. But if you're little in your own eyes, you'll perceive yourself as weak. Therefore, you have to impress men because you're afraid of them. Does that make sense? All right. So it says, though you're little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are summoned. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you... Why did you Pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. And I have brought Agag, the king of, Mal of Amalek, and I have devoted the Am Amalekites to destruction. Watch this. But the people took the spoil. Sheep and oxen, the best of the things I devoted uh, to destruction to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Watch this. But the people. Isn't he the head? If he's the king, why didn't he tell the people, don't do that? Because he was afraid of the people. He didn't fear God. But the people. And Samuel said, has the, Lord, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination. It's witchcraft. Rebellion is witchcraft. And presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Wow. Oh, look, look. Verse 24. I knew it was in here. Saul said to Samuel, watch this. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment and of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin. So he was too late at that point. Because I feared the people. Man. So why did Saul disobey the Lord? He was rejected by God. Saul was rejected because he feared the people. Fear drove Saul. So you know what after, happens after this? A new king is established, David, right? He's anointed. <laughs> after this, Saul becomes paranoid. The fear of people, the fear of man, drove Saul to madness. The scripture says that an evil spirit was sent to him to torment him. He tried to kill David. He sought after David's life. He was constantly in fear of losing the throne. Why? Because he had his identity in a title. Not in what God said about him. See, if he had really been humble, you know what he would have done? He would have stepped down when God rejected him as king. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if Saul, if Saul had really, watch this, if Saul had really been humbled by this experience with Samuel, what he would have done was he would have said, okay, Samuel, I know that I've been rejected as king. Who has God chosen as king so I might serve him? But he didn't really repent in his heart. He still feared the people. He never got rid of fear of man. He still feared the people rather than fearing God. 
You know why he was repenting? Because he was afraid of what people would think when he lost his throne. <laughs> Such a good word. If he had truly been humbled and truly repented, he says, I'm sorry, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord I, because I feared the people. He had a partly of the revelation right there, but he did not grab a hold of it fully, or he would have looked at Samuel and said, okay, who is God choosing? So I might serve him. You know why? It's all about being a servant. Saul never wanted to serve. He could, have, he could have grasped the hold of his identity, which was being a servant. And he would have been the greatest. Being a servant doesn't mean you people please either. Obviously, he was people pleasing. And that wasn't serving them. In fact, what really serves people is giving them the truth. Saul should have given the people the truth. Well, that's what makes a good servant. That's what makes a good um, servant leader. Someone who can say the hard things. Tell somebody hard stuff. Look them in the eye and say, what you're doing is wrong. And I rebuke you. But if we fear people, we'll be cowards and we won't tell them the truth. All right, let's keep going. Um, We want others to perceive good things about us. We dress to impress. We talk a big talk. Either we want others to be impressed with our big and bad, how, how big and bad we are. And when that doesn't work, what do we do? We want people to feel sorry for us. So if people aren't impressed with what we got going on, then we revert into victim mentality. Okay? The Bible says in, in, in Proverbs 29, verse 11, A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man knows how to withhold. How, he knows how to hold it back. It means... You know, you ever heard of those Facebook vent pages? Hey, look, let's go to the Facebook vent page. Everybody goes in there and just starts whining and moaning and complaining and grumbling and, right? Such and such did this. You know what that is? That's not the Facebook vent page. That's the Facebook fool page. The Facebook page of fools. A fool gives full vent. You know, people say, oh, I just need to vent. Okay, I'll let you be a fool for a minute. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we don't look everyone gets an opportunity to be foolish okay but if you stay there it'll destroy you you'll never get out i I'll, can't tell you how many people say i just need to vent you know what you know what those people do when they i'm not saying that you never vent let me say that right now i'm not saying that you never vent everybody needs an opportunity to be foolish Every, everybody needs to be child childish here and there and then they grow up right but most people who say, well, I just need to vent, you know what they do? They live their life from moment, from venting moment to venting moment. That's how they live their life. That's how they get by. I just need to vent. So they finally find somebody. And venting really becomes gossip, right? And they walk away. And they come back and, I just need to vent again. Venting really becomes gossip. And the venting isn't just that. It could be making fun of somebody. I think if you're making fun of somebody, you're picking on somebody, putting them down, that's venting. Okay? Oh, why? Another, another scripture talks about anger. I think that if you pick on somebody, you make fun of somebody, that it's actually a sign of anger. Because you're offended that they did whatever they did, and so now I've got to put them down and make them feel less than. You see? A wise man quietly holds it back. So full vent of your spirit can be two things. Number one, it can be boasting. Okay? Full venting can be boasting. Or it can be emotional, playing the victim. Okay? And when I, when I say emotional, that really, um, you might not be crying. But, you know, for instance, me, one of the reasons I wanted to talk when I was, when I was younger is I wanted people to listen to me. Why do I want people to listen to me? Because whenever they gave me an ear, it made me feel special. It made me feel important. <clears throat> so I might not have been talking about accomplishments, but I wanted to talk about myself. You see? 
And I would talk, 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 talk. And I was doing it for the wrong reasons. I was doing it to be seen by men. I wanted them to see me. I wasn't doing it for them. I wasn't serving them. See what I'm saying? I was just talking, right? You know what I'm saying? I think we talked a little bit about this, right? We talk to be heard. We want, we're, I'm not even talking because I, watch this. I'm not even talking anymore because I think that what I have to say is important. In fact, if you don't like what I have to say, I'm going to feel crushed that what I said wasn't important. Because I'm valuing what you say. Well, you're, I mean, actually, I'm valuing you listening to me rather than serving you. So there was a time, for instance, when I would do ministry, and I realized that I had this problem. Okay? I had this problem. Now, this might be slightly different than what y'all deal with, but I was a rescuer, okay? So I, I felt weak. Watch this. This is not anymore, but a while back. Uh, probably back in high school, my high school ages, I would I would listen to people and help them out. And well, the truth is, I did it. I I I did I did love them. Okay, don't get me wrong. I did I did want to help them. I had I had good intentions there, but I was insecure. Okay, I had my own insecurities. Okay, I didn't really knew who I was in God. Not until after college. Okay, I had some insecurities. So when I would help people, I helped them with good motives. I wanted to help them, but the truth was that I needed to be needed. I was insecure in my own and who I was in God, and so I wanted to help these people because if if I wasn't helping somebody, I didn't feel important. You see, so you know what would happen if I went to help somebody? Check this out. If I went to help somebody and they rejected my help. I would take it personal. And it would hurt me. Does that make sense? So those insecurities really were an issue. Does it make sense? So there had to come a, be a point where I realized that uh, who I was in God, with or without people liking me. So then I would try to extend help to people, and if they didn't show up, well, it didn't bother me. Because I knew who I was in God. And the truth was, that only happened, check this out, because I knew who I was in God, it established in me that I knew how valuable, I knew the value of what I did have to say. But I didn't have to make them see it. That make sense? It was like, it's like this. It, it'd be silly, right? If you're in, in a desert, and I have water, right? And you don't know that you need it. It would be so silly for me to come bring you water and you say no. Watch this. I know you're going to die of thirst, okay? So I bring the water to you in the desert, and then you say, no! Why would I get my feelings hurt about that? You know what I would do instead? I would feel compassion for you. I'm thinking, have you lost your mind? It'd be a different thing. I'm thinking, I have something of value you need, or you're going to die, right? But they reject it. I can't, there was no way I would take that personal. No way. Because I know how valuable the water is. You see? Their opinion about this water means nothing when it comes to me, my understanding about how important this water is. So it's the same thing with the Word of God. When I started helping people, I realized the Word of God was their life. If they rejected it, it didn't hurt me anymore. See what I'm saying? So that's whenever you know it's coming from you. What you offer, is it coming from you? Is it truly coming from God? Are you trying to, where's your motives? Where's your heart, you see? So I think that in that moment, if I've been doing ministry like that for the rest of my life, probably um, I would be in danger. I would be in danger of judgment from God because I didn't have a true, pure motive, you see? Now I get, that's why, this is why the Bible says give without expecting anything in return. I was giving, expecting something in return. Fortunately, I got kicked out of ministry, lost my title and my position, and for a whole year, I had to lick my wounds and dig deep into who I was in God. I'm thankful I got kicked out of ministry. You know, there was a time in my, in my life I wasn't very thankful for that. But I'm glad, man, if I hadn't got kicked out of the ministry, 
I went and done some soul searching and realized that my identity was in my title and my position. And that my identity was in what people thought about me rather than in what God said about me. And that transformed me and made me a servant. And so now, it doesn't even matter if anybody shows up or not. All right, last scripture. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 to 37 says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? Watch this. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. Every careless word they speak. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So, it's all about the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Be careful. Every careless word that you speak will be judged. <clears throat> Your two motivators, fear and love. The word, watch this. This is how you're going to change the way you speak. When I talk from now on, am I saying it out of fear or out of love? Has to be a decision we make. So you were you were saying um, about the foolish thing. It's foolish to vent, and it, and I agree, and that's what we were talking about. But you said maybe I just needed to be heard. Okay, so the person who's venting, when they come, when they become more. First of all, here's the thing about venting. Uh, if you're not mature, you'll just continue to vent, right? But when you start to see what you're doing. Like, you won't be able to stop yourself from venting. If you're truly foolish, it says he gives, a fool gives full vent to his spirit. It means he can't hold back. He doesn't know how to hold back. He's not wise yet. But a wise man knows how to withhold it, right? All right? So what I'm trying to say there isn't that we should never vent. It's, it's what I'm trying to say is as we grow in maturity, we'll vent less. And those who are wise will listen to someone vent. Why? Because we know that there's some insecurities there. The person is trying to process something and grow. The danger is venting to someone who's not wise. So I've had these women that were married to these men that I'm helping out. Awful women, it seems like. But they're not really awful. They're just awful because they vent to the wrong people. If they come vent to me, I could set them straight. But if they go vent to their friend, who's like, yeah, he shouldn't do that. Da, da, da. Now they just have device, more, more spirit of division, and it causes a divorce in their marriage because they, had, they were foolish and fully vented from their spirit to the wrong person. But that's why the Bible says a wise man knows how to hold back. So what does that mean? Hold back. That doesn't mean that the wise man never vents. Watch this. Back until the time to and know to, he knows how to hold back. Yeah. Sometimes he'll vent, but a fool gives full vent. Always talking. Telling everybody how he feels. Always da, 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 doesn't have any discernment about who to talk to. But a wise man knows how to hold back. It doesn't mean that he never vents. And also, if we are leaders and we want to help people, We'll listen to the person who talks. We'll listen to them. Why? Because they need they need some sure they need to be reassured. You see? So if I'm a, if I am, if I'm a wise man, then the person who's foolish, who's venting to me, I'll listen to them. Why? They're never gonna get out of their foolishness if somebody doesn't listen to them. If I don't walk them through it, you see? It could be this is the first time they've ever chosen wisely who to talk to. <laughs> you see? And now you can help them. Hey, man, look, what you're telling I've done this to people. Hey, what you're telling me right now, I'm so glad you're telling me. But you know what? I'm going to be, I'm going to, I'm going to counsel you and tell you don't tell anybody else this stuff. Because you're going to put yourself in a bind. 
It's just going to come back and bite you. And I'm actually able to counsel that person and help them become wiser and learn how to hold back. Make sense? Thank you guys for watching. I hope this teaching blessed you and, and inspired you and helped you out a little bit. Man, if, the, if it was a blessing for you, please uh, share the video, like it, leave a comment if you have questions. I'll, be, I'll try to answer these questions and whatnot. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Go to our Facebook page and make sure you've already liked the page. Hover your mouse over following and make sure see first is checked. If there's a check mark there, then you know that you'll be seeing our videos in your news feed. Also, if you're wanting to support our ministry and help fund missions work and help uh, support drug and alcohol recovery, please go to our website, boldestalignedministries.com or www.balmzs.com and you'll see here there's a donate button. You just hit this donate button right there. It'll give you an opportunity to, to sow into the ministry. Right there, you can see Boulder's Line Ministries. You can give 30 bucks a month, $50 a month, or $100 a month, or just a one-time gift if you want. Also, you can go to our website, 3rcandles.com. Remember, all the candles are handmade by our students in recovery, and so you can select from our wide range of products. I mean, we just have tons of candles, you can see right there. And also, be sure to sign up for the VIP offers. We can get 25% off your next purchase. You'll be able to receive offers we have. We're also gonna be doing some free test strips for fragrance as well so make sure that you sign up right here and, and all that good stuff so have a good day